Hello, my name is Mike. I'm professor at the Cultural Institute of Technology and together with my team we research for more than 15 years um, on the use of renewable resources, especially for polymer chemistry. Today we will be talking about a very little bit about sustainable chemistry and what it means and focus on two very simple metrics that you can use in your everyday lab um, experience how to evaluate if a reaction is sustainable, green or not. And very importantly, a message from the beginning, there is no green chemistry, it's only greener or more sustainable chemistry. So you always have to compare to an existing um, type of chemistry, to an existing reaction to claim a more sustainable chemistry. So let's get started. But before we have a look at the two most important metrics of green and sustainable chemistry, i.e. the atom economy and the E factor, let us have a very short look on the term of sustainability and what green chemistry actually is. I will only give a very brief introduction to this. I'm sure Professor Kümmerer in his video will address this in much more detail than I do. So where does the term sustainability actually come from? It was probably first used in Saxonia as the German word Nachhaltigkeit when people realized that in the context of forestry, you can only take out as many trees of a, uh, out of a forest um, as regrow within a certain period of time if you want to keep that forest and don't want to yeah, be left back without a forest at the end. So only take out what's available, what's regrowing in a certain period of time that can be used if you still want to have a forest um, after some time. Today, of course, um, sustainability is very often discussed in the context of climate change and CO2 emissions. And just to put this a very little bit into context, I have a little video for you here. And I will start it now. So this is CO2 emissions per capita as they evolve over time. And you will see they start increasing and increasing. And of course, this is one of the contributions to climate change as we put more and more fossil um, resources, fossil fuels and burn them and they produce um, CO2 in the end. This is of course known for some time and one important benchmark was the Brundtland report. Um, it was issued in 1987 and there a sustainable development was first realized and communicated and uh, a very important phrase was termed there that the development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this is somewhat a bit similar to what was uh, the thought in forestry. Um, and you can put this to any resource and also to many different things. Um, we should live today in such a fashion that our follow up generations can live at least as well as we do this today. So we shouldn't deplete their fossil reserves. We should leave them with the same climate, but also other factors like we should um, have an opportunity and provide the opportunity that they can an at least as good education, for instance, as we do, or an as least as good um, social system and at least as good um, supply of medical care. So sustainability is not only environmental sustainability, but think about it um, as a whole concept. And um, I like this term very much because if you yeah, argue or think about how we live and if this type of living allows future gener generations to have the same type of living, then um, yeah, you will realize that very often we live in a too large footprint and that we yeah, are not so nice to our future generations. Another important milestone was the so-called Rio summit, where an agreement um, on climate change uh, 
or the necessity of climate change was um, yeah, realized and communicated. And that in turn then led to the so-called Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement. So we as human beings are very well aware of the fact that we have to do something, but we're too slow and it's not happening fast enough. Um, also, a uh, further result of the Rio summit was the so-called Sustainable Development Goals of the United Na Nations. They are communicated heavily since 2016. Um, and yeah, we are doing something. We are on the right track, but it's all not enough. Also, now, if you look at the finished video on the right hand side, you see that uh, some industrialized countries are actually decreasing their CO2 emissions per capita. Um, but still, the emissions are too high. And to really reach this one and a half or two degrees goal of maximum temperature change, on our planet, we have to do much, much more. Of course, these are global and very large efforts uh, necessary for this, and chemistry can um, yeah, contribute to this and also contribute to sustainability. And this is, on a very basic level, what we will look on in the next slides. So, what is green chemistry? Green chemistry is a toolbox to be more resource efficient, to design safer molecules, safer chemicals, safer materials, and also to design safer processes. This was um, explained by Anastas and Warner when they uh, published their 12 principles of green chemistry. Um, long forms of these 12 principles can be found in the um, citation given in the lower right. What has been established is a very simple phrase to remember what green chemistry is about. It's about productively. So how to be productive. And this very often also relates to better green chemistry metrics. And then, of course, in addition to that, being inherently safe and um, avoiding toxic chemicals. So let's go through this productively. First of all, P, for preventing waste. Of course, it's obvious that if you produce less waste at the end, your chemistry was more efficient, more productively, but also you have, you have less waste to dispose and you're overall more environmentally friendly. The R is for renewable materials, and I show an example here of renewable feedstocks for monomer and polymer synthesis, and there are many different examples here. Um, so the typical renewable resources such as terpenes or vegetable oils or also carbohydrates, as well as CO2, can be built into polymeric materials, and some of these are on their way to being commercialized and to uh, substitute fossil-based polymers, and some are more in the research stage, but a lot is developing in this area. Why is this especially important? Um, because polymeric materials are the largest output of the chemical industry, with an annual production of more than 300 million tons. So if we can substitute um, some of the fossil-based polymers uh, more and more over the time by renewable-based polymers and also look at their recyclability, degradability and other aspects of sustainability, we can really contribute to a more sustainable chemistry. The next one, O, is also obvious, I think. Um, it's to omit derivatization steps. Of course, it's much cleaner and easier if you don't have to do a three-step synthesis. So here going from A via B and C to D, but you can directly go to D. So a typical example of organic chemistry is protecting group chemistry. So we, if you can find a catalyst that can directly and selectively uh, functionalize one functional group without using a protecting group for the other functional group that might be in your molecule, this is, of course, more efficient in the end. 
and produces less waste. The next is degradable chemical products. And that's of course good if things are biodegradable and you can leave them outside and they will leave no harm to, to the environment and degrade into benign degradation products. But even better might be recycling than degradable. So keeping um, your product, for instance, your polymer, as long as possible in the loop and in an application. And then, of course, if it's degraded, um, it's a good thing. And if it's not polluting the environment at the end. The use of safe synthesis methods is also obvious, of course. Um, this is, um, as it says, a safety issue, not only for the person working on the chemistry at the moment, but also, of course, for the environment. So no explosion hazard, no toxic reagents, and so on. A very important pillar of green chemistry is catalysis. Of course, if you do not have to use stoichiometric reagents, but you can use a catalyst instead, it prevents waste. And the catalyst, as already explained above, can, of course, also make a synthesis more efficient, uh, more selective, and by this also reducing waste, also changing the energy profile, using less energy, less heat to um, allow the re reaction to proceed. This brings us to the next, the T, which stands for temperature and pressure, and it should be combined. So you shouldn't heat. This causes um, CO2 emissions, of course. But even worse is cooling, it uses much more energy than uh, heating. Um, so if you can run your reaction just as room, at room temperature, this is, of course, much better. The same counts for pressure. In-process monitoring is also important. Um, for small scale, but especially for big scale operations. Um, in this way, you can prevent um, yeah, accidents. If you see that, for instance, the temperature is rising quickly, you can turn off your um, plant and by this avoid explosions <clears throat> and contribute to safety. Very few auxiliaries. This is the same idea as catalytic reagents and as well as uh, using um, direct synthesis protocols, so no derivatization steps. So you see some of these principles repeat themselves, and overall this contributes then to a more sustainable synthesis, to a greener synthesis. The E factor uh, is basically also the same like prevent waste. Um, it should maximize the throughput, let's say, so all of your starting materials should end up in the product. We will have a look at this E factor um, on a separate slide and I will explain what exactly this is. Of course, toxicity um, is a very important issue and you should avoid any kind of toxic chemicals throughout, even if it's renewable. A typical example is epichlorohydrin, which can be um, obtained from renewable glycerol since a few years, also on industrial scale, but that doesn't make the chemical itself yeah, less toxic or inherently safer. Of course, it's a step towards sustainability, but such toxic chemicals, if possible, should be avoided by any means because yeah, it's not smart. We are smart, and if we use smart chemistry, we can come up with better solutions. And now, if you have gone through all this um, productively, at the end, you're at, yes, it's safe. So this is then a synthesis that can be claimed as greener. So these 12 principles allow you, in a very simple manner, by checking, making cross marks or check marks, um, if your synthesis fits to the principles of green chemistry. And as a general guideline, you should consider that your synthesis becomes even greener, even more sustainable, the more of these 12 principles you can adhere on. Or the other way around, if you violate one of the 12 principles, you should really rethink your process and come up with a better, a smarter, a greener solution. A typical example is 
Don't use a toxic solvent, don't use a chlorinated solvent. It's so easy to replace them. There are solvent selection guides. And this is, for organic synthesis, one of the major sources of waste, but also toxic emissions. Um, so by sticking to the 12 principles, you can go in the right direction and make your overall process more sustainable. And then very quickly, where does this concept of green chemistry show up or how do you place it? There is, of course, a large bubble, a large cir circle of overall sustainability. Um, and many different factors can contribute to sustainability. For instance, the reduction of CO2 emissions. And then there is green engineering and sustainable chemistry. And within sustainable chemistry, green chemistry offers you the tools to be overall more sustainable. So let's start and discuss one of the most important um, metrics for green and sustainable chemistry, the atom economy. The atom economy was introduced by Barry Trost in 1991 and it's easiest to look at the formula to understand what it expresses. So the atom economy in percent is the molecular weight of the desired product or products divided by the molecular weight of all products and then of course times 100 to get a percentage and it basically tells you that as many atoms as possible of the starting materials should end up in the desired products at the end of the reaction um, let's have a very general look on the atom economy, so what kind of reactions might offer a high atom economy and what kind of reactions might offer a lower atom economy. And if you think about your organic chemistry knowledge, you will realize that an isomerization or an addition or a rearrangement, all of these reactions do not lose in exclamation marks um, atoms throughout this reaction have a very high atom economy. So an addition reaction has 100% atom economy. For instance, a deals other reaction is very often quoted in this sense. Both reactants, the diene and the dienophile, react and um, this gives a 100% atom economy. Catalytic reactions are next and offer high atom economy. Derivatization reactions are not so good. Um, so additional reaction steps, of course, reduce the atom economy. And if you think about a substitution or an elimination reaction, this is, of course, a very bad atom economy. So it's most obvious for an elimination. You lose part of your molecule, which is eliminated from your molecule. And of course, these atoms then are not part of the product anymore. And Thus, um, they are lost in exclamation marks. And um, thus, the atom economy is considerably lower than for an isomerization or an addition reaction. But what is the worst, actually, in terms of atom economy? Well, it's no product formation at all. Of course, this is the worst part. We want a reaction to proceed. And this also comes back to my initial statement. So um, it's always to see relative to each other. If you evaluate sustainability, of course, if a certain product is needed, you just want to choose the best way to get there. But if a reaction does not proceed at all, it's of course also not helpful overall. So let's have a look at an example of how to calculate atom economy and then also what these numbers actually tell us. Let us compare two very simple reactions. First, the elimination of HCl from ethyl chloride to produce um, the set HCl as well as ethylene. And second, as a comparison, the elimination of water from ethanol to also produce ethylene and water. So next we calculate the atom economy of both reactions. 
And this is very simple. We just have to remember what the atom economy is. It's the molar mass of the product, the wanted product, divided by the molar mass of all products. So for the first equation, we take the molar mass of ethylene and divide it by the molar mass of ethylene and HCl. And if we put in the numbers, we get 43.5%. And the same we do for um, the second equation, where we eliminate water from um, ethanol. And what we get at the end here is an atom economy of 60.9%. So now let's discuss a little bit what these numbers actually mean. So first of all, these numbers tell us that the atom economy of reaction number two is higher than the atom economy of reaction number one. So far, so good. So the second reaction should be more sustainable. But it doesn't tell us at all if the second or the first reaction actually work or if any product is produced. So the yield, as you see, of these reactions is not taken into account. Um, this can be overcome by, for instance, using the so-called actual atom economy. So you would mul multiply these two percentages by the yield also in percent. So this would be one step further. It also doesn't tell you if you just look at this bare number of the atom economy, um, what type of additional reagents you need. Do you need a catalyst? Do you need a base here for the elimination? Do you require high temperatures? Do you have to purify all the compounds? And so on and so on. So if you think about this number, you realize it's a purely a theoretical number that is calculated just by looking at the reaction equation, but otherwise it doesn't tell you much. So it's a first step to evaluate a sustainability or a greenness or compare different reactions to each other, but practical use is really, really limited. And this is why we will now discuss the so-called E-factor some of the disadvantages um, that the atom economy has. So for instance, that you do not include the solvent that you need for the synthesis and the calculation, or that you do not consider the yield, can be overcome by the so-called environmental factor, the E factor. This E factor was introduced by Roger Sheldon, and it is a very simple metric. It is the amount of waste and unwanted side products divided by the amount of product that you actually form. Typically, um, you refer this to one kilogram of product. So how many kilos of waste are you producing per kilogram of product? And then in this waste and unwanted side products, you can include really everything, starting from the solvent, the catalyst you might need, um, also the purification steps. So if you do a synthesis typically in the lab and you use a lot of silica gel to purify your compound, your E factor will be very, very high. Of course, you can also do things like um, recycling. So for instance, you can calculate an E factor with solvent recycling and without solvent recycling and compare them to each other. Um, it's a very useful metric to compare different synthesis protocols already at the lab scale with each other to decide which one has advantages in terms of sustainability and of course not. It's very simple as put here in this uh, very simple graphic also. So you have your raw materials, you do your synthesis. You get a product, this is what you want, and of course you get also waste. And in this simple example, you start with three kilos, let's say, of starting materials. You make one kilo of product and two kilos of waste, so your E factor is two. And for a classic lab scale synthesis, an E factor of two is not so bad, actually. If you look at the petrochemical industry, for instance, where only a lot of distilling is done and cracking is done and everything is used, the E-factor is very low, cl goes close to zero. 
Um, and this is actually what we would like to have, of course, to produce as little waste as possible. But then again, if you look at a pharmaceutical that has several synthesis steps, you might end up with effectors that are above 100. Um, so there is a lot of room to improve and to make things more sustainable at the end. So we're at the end of um, this short presentation today, and I hope I could give you an overview um, of how to assess the sustain sustainability of a chemical synthesis. Very simple tools, but if you employ them on an everyday um, basis in your synthesis routines, in optimizing a catalytic reaction, for instance, or um, designing a new synthesis, you can very easily implement sustainability metrics and have arguments why the one or the other synthesis is more sustainable. And remember, more sustainable very often also means more efficient.